Well, welcome to Sunny Hill. My name is Richard. I'm one of the leaders here. It's great to have you. Um, I wanted to jump in to say everything I'm going to speak about today, you have to see a silent character. Now, I was thinking about how to show this, and last time I realized I preached, and I had people stand up here for as long as I was standing up here, and I thought, that's a good way to go about it. So I'm going to do that again. Oh, thank you so much, Josh. So Adam, Adam Clark, you're a guy who likes to stand for a long period of time. I know you've just sat down, and now you're back up. So I'm going to put Adam in the back. Pretty much that's all he's going to be doing is just standing in the back. Just this, right here, dude. No, not behind the curtain. Like, yeah, that's good. Just there. He's a looming character across everything I'm talking about this morning. And as a character, I want you to picture that this is grace. Not a woman grace. This is the, uh, that lesser known hairy woman grace. This is, this is the grace of God. It's really important. Always looming in the back is the grace of God. Because if you lose sight of the grace of God, you are going to get lost in my message today and then walk away and go, I'm never coming back. So don't lose sight of the grace of God. Always looming here in the background. Always looming in the background. Now, I grew up in South Africa, and one of the stark differences between South Africa and the United Kingdom is the amount of bugs and insects that exist. In South Africa, we have way more bugs, insects, moths, anything of that nature than I've ever experienced in the UK. And when you do something like a barbecue, anything at nighttime where there is any kind of light, you're instantly just like swarmed by these bugs. They're just everywhere all around you. And so what you get is like a bug zapper. And I'm sure you can get them here. I've just never seen them. You hang the bug zapper up, it emits a light that is really attractive to moths and other insects, and while you sit there, you're just here the whole night, zoot, 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 and you look up, and these little moths and insects are just flying into this zapper, totally getting annihilated and burnt up, little tiny sparks, little bits of smoke, and it's just a really nice, pleasant accompaniment. You're pouring your heart out to someone, sharing them the struggles that are going on, and in the background, you look up and there's smoke and little like bits of bug just like flying off in the wind, and you think, it's doing its job. It's working really well. The interesting thing is, is I think we have a problem because we are like the moths and the insects. Sin is the zapper. And no matter how many of our friends we see fly towards the zapper and get zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
what you want. I do not believe God will stand sending people to hell all angry. You go there. You suck. I think his heart will break. And he will go, this is how much I love you now. If you do not want to be with me, I will give you the place where I will no longer be. Man, and that place is hell. I cannot conceive of a place where the love and grace of God is removed. And so if you don't know Jesus, sin is a huge problem. Because ultimately, it drives you away from the very thing that can bring fullness, completion, and absolute transformation to your life. And in the background, there's grace. God going, undeserved, but I've made a way for you to come into relationship with me. And if you're a Christian, and you know Jesus... You have a problem. I have a problem. Because for some reason, like the moth, we are still choosing to fly to the zapper. We watch our friends approach it and get destroyed. We see the things our friends do and they get destroyed. We see the things that happen in the world as people are going towards sin and get destroyed. And we look and we go, I know Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus is amazing, my God, my God, I need you. Whoa, look at that light. Ooh, that's really nice. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, Dom. Whoa, Dom's taken down. Still that light, so compelling. It's a real issue. It's a real issue. Because no matter how many people we see destroyed by it, for some reason, and I say this to myself as to you, we still want to go back there to the light, zappa thing that we know is destructive. And yet always in the background looms this thing, grace. So I'm going to offer you two different things now, and you get to make a choice. You get to make a good choice or a bad choice, but you get to make... A choice. We all know that there is a thing created that is probably in the top three creations in the world. Like, I'm absolutely convinced that God made this. I have no biblical evidence for this, but go with me. I'm absolutely convinced that God made this right at the beginning of time. And that is chocolate. This could be one of the greatest inventions ever made. Chocolate brings people together. Somebody's angry with you, give them a chocolate. It's all fine. Chocolate is how we celebrate. Easter eggs, Christmas chocolate, Valentine's Day chocolate. I'm feeling down chocolate. I'm feeling happy chocolate. It's just a regular day chocolate. It's a chocolate bar. It's a chocolate slab. It's Swiss chocolate. Ooh. It's not Swiss chocolate. Man, let's be honest. We've all been there. The only thing in the house is cooking chocolate, and you think, yeah, good enough. Good enough. You can say you won't do it, but you know it's true. When you put it in your mouth and you think, whoa, that's not right. But I'm going to keep going anyway. I'll keep going back. We've all been there. The one, this is on the side. The one time I came in, and on the table, what I saw in a silver wrapper the most beautiful piece of chocolate I've ever seen in my life. In my head, I went, this chocolate is so luxury that it's come individually wrapped. Nobody was around, and I was all like, rookie mistake, family. And I took this chocolate, and I threw it in my mouth, and it happened to be a beef stock cube. <laughs> and let me tell you, it was shocking, absolutely Shocking. But it's one of the greatest creations ever made, chocolate. Now, one of the worst creations ever made, and the reason that I know it is, is this, cre this creation brought the downfall of man upon us. 
fruit. If you don't believe me, go back to Genesis 1, and you will see, or Genesis 2, Genesis 3, somewhere in that realm, don't eat the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. And they did. And the whole of society and mankind collapsed. Fruit. Now, every doctor in the world is going to tell you, this is healthy for you. This is unhealthy for you. Eat these and you won't get fat and end up potentially keeling over. I say that to myself. Eat these and a very different thing works out in your life. Uh, we were at a barbecue yesterday where they were trying to do this thing where you have to step over a pole without touching the pole. And what we realized is depending on the size of your gut, depended whether or not you could pull that feet off. And there were a few of us there, not naming any names, who couldn't do it. Maybe because we've been choosing this over this. Fruit, chocolate, yummy. And this is the conundrum. You can tell me till you're blue in the face every great thing that will happen if I eat this. And I'm telling you now, I'm choosing that. I'm choosing that. They can go on a campaign. The government can put out posters. Eat more fruit, five a day. I'm like, if it doesn't come in this form, it ain't happening. Do raisins in fruit, nut, raisin flavored chocolate, which is a great flavor of chocolate. Does that count towards my five a day? Because if it does, we're sorted. But if it doesn't, it's not happening. It's not happening. They can tell me that this thing is going to produce every good, healthy outcome you're ever after in your life. And there is a strong chance that you and me are still choosing this thing. I don't know if you get it. Sin is an issue, man. God can tell you every bad thing that's going to work out in your life if you choose to sin. God can tell you every single thing that could go wrong in your relationships if you choose to pursue sin. God can show you from the people around you as they've made concrete choice to sin how destructive it is. And he can go, there is a better way than this. There is a better thing for you to have. It is healthy for you. It will produce great outcome and fruit in your life. It will bring you what you're looking for. And we look at all of that and we go, I choose this. I choose sin. Man, and this isn't a non-Christian problem. This is a me and you problem. It's a Christian problem. No matter how many people we know who are destroyed by the zapper, ooh, something about that light. And yet always in the background, grace, grace. It's really interesting. If you look at Matthew 21, you read these words. Matthew 21, verse 8, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. 21, 9, the crowds that went ahead said, those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And then it says this, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. They said, who is this? And the crowd said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth from Galilee. And this is called Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, what happened is, is Jesus arrived. And the people came out going, Jesus, 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 we love you, Jesus. And they got these big, like huge palms. And they were waving these palms. And they were singing and dancing. And Jesus came in on a donkey, and it was all happening, and it was great. And people said, who is this man? And they're going, don't you see who it is? This is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. He's amazing. This is us on a Sunday. We praise you, Lord. We're jumping up and down. What a great message. So powerful. It's changed my life. I'm going up for prayer ministry. Woo, I've been prayed for. Things are so different. Let's jump ahead now. 
Matthew 27. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. 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 Barabbas, they answered. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. Sorry, 23. What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him, 24. When Pilate saw that they were getting nowhere, he insisted, um, and, and, but instead that an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands, and in front of the crowd, he said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. And in 25, all the people answered, his blood is on our hands and our children. And then he released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flocked and handed over to be crucified. This is Good Friday in the Easter calendar, where the people stood and went, give us Barabbas, the mercenary, the guy who's a murderer, and let's kill the innocent person. Here's the thing. Between Palm Sunday and Good Friday, do you know how much time passed? One week. One week. We love you so much, Jesus. Crucify him. Crucify him. We can praise with our lips one day, and we can dishonor him in our lives the next. Because sin is a real problem. It's a real problem. I find that crazy in that story. That the very people who were welcoming him in are the very people who called for him to be killed. And who chose definitely the worst of what was put on offer. And all I can think of is this. I know I should, but I would much rather. The scary part is this. You can do good things without being a good person, but you can't be a good person without doing good things. You can display the fruit without believing in Jesus, but you cannot believe in Jesus and not display the fruit. And I want to tell you why. It's always in the background, it's this little thing. Grace. See, the Bible speaks about a reality, and I really hope that if you can get this, it will bring something into your life today. And it speaks directly into who you are. The Bible speaks about this tension you, as a Christian, live in. Between who you are now, because of what Jesus has done for you, and who you once were, as you are slowly becoming the very thing you already are now, because Jesus has made you this. It's a tension between the already and the not yet. I'm already this, but I'm not yet it. I'm already that, but I'm not yet it. I'm already these things, and I'm not yet it. It's this weird space we exist in as Christians that helps us to begin to understand what are the things inside of our lives that we need to take a hold of because actually, if we keep doing them, they are so out of kilter, so out of alignment with what we actually are that it's kind of a violation to who we are now. The Bible talks about the fact that once you came into faith with Jesus, the old is gone and the new has come. It's a great thing. All of your old rubbish is gone. You are now a new creation in Christ. You are fundamentally different in Jesus. Yet, 
the reality is for most of us, I feel like the old is all around. Where's the tension? Already, not yet. I'm not yet quite it, but I already am it. And my life is about making sure I start to align myself into what I already am. And who you are, wait for it, it's going to blow your mind, is no longer a sinner. Hold on. I don't know if you've heard that often enough in church. You're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. On the cross, to go, that is no longer who you are. You are now my son, my daughter, adopted into my family. This is who you are now. Those things you were a slave to, you are no longer a slave to. Those things that held you captive, now no longer held you captive. Those feelings and experiences that pushed you down, now no longer push you down. Why? Because when you look that side, you have to go, I am not that. I am this. You aren't. Who are the light? Ooh. That's not who you are anymore. Yet, we have a problem. Me and you. Because when you're presented with who you actually are, we still choose who we were. And I cannot say that I'm a follower of Jesus without the works starting to manifest in my life that show that I am. I can be here and I can show all of the good things we think a Christian should be and not know Jesus. That's absolutely possible. But I cannot go, I have found Jesus. He has entered into my heart. His spirit is at work in me and living in me without it manifesting as good works in my life. It's an impossibility. Yet, I know at times that isn't what's going on. It's really interesting. Read this in Romans 7, 19. It says this, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. I, I, I do not do the good I want to do, but I actually keep on doing the stuff I don't want to do. And I can't help it. I just keep doing it. Because I'm the crowd. Praising Jesus one day and shouting for him to be crucified the next. But it carries on. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who did it, but sin living in me. This is written by Paul, the great Christian, who tells us, I've been taken by God to see things I can't even write about. And he's the guy who's going, if I carry on in the way I am, it's sin now living in me. It's sin living in me. Because I'm telling you, sin is a massive problem in our lives. We need to realize that we aren't actually that anymore. You are not a sinner. God has set you free. And it's for freedom that God has set you free. So that you're not stuck in this place of going, I know I'm not this anymore, but I'm stuck right here. But actually, you can go, I'm beginning to align my life to this. And this is where this beautiful man comes in. Because without Jesus, without Jesus, God goes, look there, look there. There's your way. 
you don't know Jesus, there's your way. If you don't know God, there's your way. You need some hope, there's your way. You need somebody to come into your life and help to transform it, help to free you, help to take away the stuff that's killing you, that's binding you down, that's breaking you and destroying you. God's going, there's your way, and there's nothing you can do to get it. There is no path to get there. It is literally just presented to you. Take it if you want it. It's grace. It's undeserved. And it's available to everybody. And now, as we live in the tension, once we've committed to that, we look and we go, God, I know that the sin is going to destroy my life. God, I know it is, but I can't stop it. And I think this is where grace comes in. Because I think God comes and goes, what are you doing? It's not who you are. Be who you are. Sometimes my kids annoy me. For good reason. Because they're being annoying. Not just because I'm annoyed at them. And they'll act in certain ways that's so out of alignment with the, who I know they, them to be. The character that they carry. That as a father, I don't go, get out the house. Never come back. I want nothing more to do with you. You are gone. <laughs> what I do is I go, what are you doing? It's not who you are. Let me tell you, that's grace. Could God kick you out if he wanted to? Yes, he could. For some of the things we choose to do, even after God has said, don't do it. And you know what grace pushes God to do? To go, it's not who you are. Come on. Come on. I find that a freeing. I find it amazing. It makes me look and go, okay, if I'm that, how do I stop being this? How do I stop being this? And move towards him. And let me tell you, the first thing that lets you do that is this, grace. Without it, we are all stuffed. But with it, whoo, something different starts to work out. Because every time you sin, God is screaming at you as loud as he can. It's not who you are, come on, come on. Paul actually talks about this um, dichotomy. He says, because of grace, or should we just carry on sinning then? Should we just keep sinning anyway? And he goes, no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. We should stop. It's so out of kilter with who we are. We need to stop. We need to stop. You see, I think what happens in our lives is we become sin tolerators, not sin obliterators. Now, that is cheesy because I couldn't think of a better word. So it's where we're at. But if you're making notes, we become sin tolerators, not sin obliterators. And this is where you may feel a little bit wanting to do pushback on me or scream at me or throw something at me. That's cool. I've got grace here. So <laughs> grace protects you every time. We're the worst at this in church. We, we disguise gossip as pastoral care. That's horrendous. Let's just say it for what it is. It's horrendous. It's not who we are. Do you know where non-Christians should feel the most welcome? Right here. And do you want to know why? Because for most of us, we need to look at them and go, do you think you're bad? I'm worse. But by the grace of God. So I, sorry, Ben, didn't mean to offend you. Oh, you're coming to play keys. I've got 10 minutes. You're all, I've had enough. I'm out. I'm done. I'm done. Fair enough. Thank you, Ben. 
Ben's all like Grace, this. <laughs> I love you, Ben. Well, it surrenders. It surrenders. We engage in discussions. And instead of going, who we are now is this, and calling to each other that, Adam, 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 what you're saying, dude, no, no, actually, you're the worst one because you're grace. Let's not use you. <laughs> Dom, instead of saying what you're saying, instead of speaking how you're saying, stop it. It's not who you are. You are more than that. You are better than that. Crazy. This is called making a disciple. You are more than that. You're better than that. Don't do it. What we do is we go, well, you know, they had to unburden to me. It's pastoral care. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's gossip. We should call it out for what it is when it happens. This doesn't mean that people can't come and share their problems. But when I'm coming to share to Dom, um, you know, Josh's problems, that ain't a pastoral <laughs> unburdening. That's me going, you will not know what Josh has done. Man. The Bible has so many verses about this. Take the plank out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. We tolerate dishonor and call it maturity. I think you ever thought about this. Dishonoring our parents. Dishonoring our leaders. Well, it's just because I got an opinion now. I'm growing up. It's not. The Bible actually does say that God won't bless dishonor. He won't bless it. It's not who we are anymore. Who we are are people who honor each other. This is who we are. Ben's an amazing keyboardist. He sacrificially gives his time up to come and play for us so that when we come here, we can sing. Irrespective if Ben's gone, yeah, but I'm going to play keyboards to get you off stage sooner. Irrespective. It's not a sign of maturity to diss Ben. It's not. Do you know what is a sign of maturity? It's to honor him. Even if I think he may not deserve it. It's to honor him. Do you know why you should do that? This is just on the side. Because of this thing. Beautiful grace. Do I agree with everything the government does? Absolutely not. And if you've listened to Fire Mountain, no. And if you want to see where this gets done wrong at times, watch Fire Mountain. Honestly, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. But grace means that we still need to honor our leaders. I may not agree with you. I may think the decisions you've made are idiotic, but I'm going to honor you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lift you up. Because this is what we do. Because this is who we are now. And between the already and the not yet comes this thing. That so many of us scoff at. So many of us laugh at. That's not a Christian thing. I wanted to spell that today. Because do you want to know how you start to align your life from here so you can become who you already are? Start to put the habits in place. Start to put the habits in place to produce holiness in your life. To begin to produce gratitude, compassion, love, sincerity, humility. Start to build those habits in your life. You know why? Because you already are them. So start to become them. Start to move towards it. And know that on the way, when you get it wrong, God's grace is there going, come on. He's not who you are. Let's get going. You should build the habits and let the Holy Spirit come and infect them. Power them. Oh, God. I can't love the people around me. They're idiots. They're absolute idiots. But I don't want to fly towards that light. I don't want to eat the chocolate because I'm not that anymore. What do I need to do? Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to say an encouraging thing to someone I really don't like. And if a lot of you come up and encourage me after this, I will know. I will know what's going on in your hearts. Okay. Oh, my word. There they are. What an idiot. Oh, Holy Spirit, I need you now. Come on. Give me the power. 
hey, it's great to see you. I just want to really encourage you for how you're serving. It's so amazing. So thank you so much. <laughs> and slowly but surely as you build these habits in, do you know what's crazy? I love you all. I value you all. I treasure you all. You're not an idiot. Oh, I totally disagree with you. I love you, man. I love you. It's who I am. It's who I am. I'm not a sinner. Saved by grace. Set free. So I can go into the world. And I can be the light. And I can show people Jesus. That's what we're here to do. And make disciples. And you put the habits in place. And you build them. And you let the Holy Spirit empower them. And you begin to see yourself shifting and changing and knowing that always in the background is beautiful grace. That when you stumble and fall and do something wrong and you break open that chocolate bar, which is a duo, and you devour two, and then you realize it was one pound 70 for two bars. So you've got another one waiting in the boot of your car, which you're going to power back. That God's looking at you with chocolate smothered all over your face and on your hand. Just going, what have I done? Oh, I feel ill. Going, it's not who you are. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm not going to drive you away. I'm not going to push you away. I'm not going to kick you away. Because I already know who you are. Come and be this. Because I believe in you. I know you can do it. Because you already are it. I don't know about you. I love that. I don't want to be in the crowd who waves palm trees one day for Jesus and cries for him to be crucified the next simply because I think this is a bit more appealing, simply because that's a little bit more exciting. I want to be the person in the crowd who looks at everyone else and says, What are you doing? It's Jesus. The Savior of the world, the King of Kings, the one who's going to bring the answer to all of the problems we have. It's the King there. What are you doing? Don't shout for Barabbas. Don't do it. Shout for Je Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, only me. Okay, Jesus, Jesus. I want to be that guy. Not the guy who's all, where did that light come from? What? Whoa, whoa. whoa, that's weird. Ah, it won't happen to me. I'll be fine. I don't want to be that guy. For a while now, I've been thinking about faith. And I've realized something. That so much of faith, we wrap out into the outcome. If I have enough faith, God will do these things. I'm realizing as I get older, because I have faith, I'm going to remain faithful, even if he doesn't do these things. Faith should drive you to faithfulness, despite the outcome. And let me tell you, Simon and Becca, when they got up here, I know their struggle that they've been through. And through their struggle and heartache, and absolute pain, and absolutely going, what is happening here? God, what are you doing? How is this working out? This tension of the already and the not yet was still at work, where they were going, it's easy for us to give up, to walk away and go, stuff this whole church thing. I don't care. And what they did is, is they went, our faith will drive us to faithfulness because we can't yet see the outcome but we already are. And so we'll come and worship when we don't want to. We'll come and unpack a trailer and pack everything down and put it away. And we'll make sure that there's Mother's Day crafts to give out for moms. And we'll make sure that there's a small group happening in the midst of their craziness. And this is not just to like blow them up. You know what they did is they went around to their neighbors and said, hey, should we host a jubilee party on our street? 
man, I don't have any problems and I'm not going to do that to my neighbors. That's how heathen I am. Man, I need Jesus. That for me is amazing. Faith driving to faithfulness. You know why? It's in the background. It's grace. Grace. It's who you are now. Come and be it. Sin is a problem. You can spend the rest of your life choosing the chocolate instead of the apple. But I'm telling you now, you're no longer that. You are not this person anymore. You are this person. This is what Jesus has done for you. Now it's time to start to become who you are. Become who you are. Become who you are. I'm going to invite you to stand where you are. And I'm going to invite the band back up. And we're going to go back into just a worship song. And then um, Josh and Louise will come after that and close out the service. But if something I've been speaking about today has made you go, I really disagree with that. I'm really angry about it. Please email Lansdowne Baptist at... Um, if something that has been said today has really kind of just sparked something in you and you're feeling like, I just need someone to pray that in. I just need someone to speak to God about that for me. Uh, Colin and Joe will be here on the side and they'll be open to you coming and just praying with you. Uh, we trust them. They are safe people to come to. If you feel like you might need to come down there and Helen is there, great, and feel like you just may need to unburden yourself, just maybe confess a sin that's really got you to grips. I'm telling you now, these people won't judge you. They're not going to write it down. They're not going to walk away and tell other people about what's going on. We have complete confidence in them. It's why they're there. But this is a chance for you just to come and go, I need to deal with some stuff. If you found yourself stuck in a point going, I'm repeatedly choosing the chocolate today, you don't need to do that anymore. It's not who you are. And if you're going, Richard, I don't know Jesus but I really want to. I would encourage you, find me, find anybody who's been up on the stage after the service. We would count it an absolute privilege to be able to speak to you about coming into faith and following Jesus. But I'd encourage you, don't get caught out in the chocolate apple conundrum. Don't fly towards the zapper. It's no longer who you are. Be who you are. God, we come to you now as imperfect people made perfect because of you. We come to you now, God, as people who are something new and yet still feel like we're something old and frail and broken. We come to you now, God, as people who seemingly want to ongoingly choose sin, even though it's no longer who we are. And so right now, God, I, for myself, want to say that I choose to be who I am, who you've made me. I choose to begin to put habits in place to align my life to who I already am. And I pray your Holy Spirit right now, God, would come and fall on the people as they're choosing to begin to put structures in place in their lives and habits that will let them begin to live out the very things that they already are, who you've called them to be. We need a move and an empowering of your Spirit. Not for our church space right now, God. We need one for our tomorrow. Because we can praise you today, but we don't want to call for you to be crucified tomorrow. We want to be the ones, God, who are calling people to you. Not going toward the zapper. So I just pray right now that your spirit would just come and move amongst us. Take what we've been speaking about and thinking through. Seal it on our hearts. Seal it in our minds. Challenge us where we need to be challenged and transform us where we need to be transformed.